Okay, welcome back to another roasting New Zealand summer weekend. It's Waitangi weekend, that's probably not how you pronounce it. That is like a summer bank holiday for the guys here, something to do with a treaty being signed between the Maori and the Europeans. I haven't got quite as far as working out like what exactly that was yet. It is like a summer bank holiday basically, it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday off. What there is on this weekend is the Gore AMP, and Gore is like a local market town. Yeah, it's probably the best word for it. It'd be a really good opportunity to go around, hopefully see some familiar faces and see what a New Zealand agricultural show is like. So you and I will be able to ring the changes um, with what you'd expect in the UK. If you're watching from the UK, maybe you're watching from the United States, maybe you're watching from India, who knows where you're watching from, but let me know how this compares to what you have uh, at home. As I was driving down to the show, I realized I haven't actually shared that much about the area I've been working in. Although I'm living just over the border in Otago, much of the practice and the work is based in the New Zealand region of Southland, with Gore being one of the major hubs. When Hattie and I first organized our trip to New Zealand and settled on Gore as a destination, I have to admit most reactions were either totally blank or an active recall before asking us, Gore, really? And when we landed in the relatively international and trendy Queenstown, we got the same reactions. Even when we arrived here, some of the locals couldn't work our choice out. So, now I've been here for all of six months, let me introduce you to Gore. A quick Google will show you, yes, the town is the New Zealand capital of country music. As you scroll down to find something more promising to show your girlfriend who's moving there with you, you find an even greater accolade, the brown trout capital of the world. Stay here for five minutes and you'll notice the South Island has a strong outdoorsman tradition. And down here in the deep south, this seems to manifest in a powerful rod and rifle culture. If it runs, they'll stalk it. If it swims, they'll hook it. If it flies, they'll shoot it. Perhaps the only aspect of the culture that could rival hunting is its farming heritage. And the ANP or agricultural and pastoral shows are part of this. Traditionally a beef and sheep region, you'll now find predominantly milking cows since the dairy boom of the last 20 years or so. As some of you will know, I grew up in London, which may as well be in a different universe, so farming shows didn't feature in my calendar. But in my adoptive home of Northumberland, they are important social fixtures, both the small local shows and the relative giants like the Highland Show. What I wanted to find out today was, what was a Southland agricultural show like? And would it bear any resemblance Hello. to what I'm used to I'm very good. in Northumberland? Stay in the shape. <laughs> okay, so once I'm through the gate, it's all very familiar. You guys will know I'm not a machinery man. It just doesn't light my fire. But it is a big part of the show's home and apparently here too. For the trade, it is a great opportunity to get the tools in front of the people who will buy them. And I did have a question I've been asking myself since seeing them all over the road here. Why do these tractors have so many wheels? I had to ask a contractor to find out. If you think you know, let me know your answer in the comments. After that cursory look around the steel stuff, I left the guys there to argue about what the best color of tractor is or which dealership gives the best free set of overalls with their 100 grand piece of kit. I stopped by the practice tent just to check on some of my colleagues, some of whom were more willing video participants than others. Then I went after what you and I will be most interested in, and that's the livestock. There were some poultry, so some chickens, some waterfowl, even some fancy pigeons. Then I found the sheep, certainly less quaffed, less preened, a bit less pristine and in their working clothes than what you'd expect to find in the UK. As for the breeds, they were pretty much the same as what I'd seen at the Ram Fair a couple of weeks before. If you saw the short that I did for that, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you didn't, the link's in the description. After the sheep, I hit the jackpot. Right, the one thing I've been struggling to find is some cattle, but I followed my ears and I found them. So let's see what we can see breed-wise. Um, 
nothing coming away from the, the weed heifer. You're doing a calf well. It wasn't long before I found someone familiar with one of the bigger showings of the day. Ah, oh, how are you? I'm good. Good to stay up, Yeah. <laughs> this here is Mark Tiller. He is here with a cohort of this slightly more unusual beef breed. I ended up having a really interesting chat with him, which I thought actually deserved its own five minute video, which I'll release early next week. In the meantime, if any of you guys know what breed of cattle these are, say so in the comments. And if you want to cheat, I put the link to the Facebook page for the herd in the video description. So that's most of the beefies. We're just gonna have a look at the uh, dairy now and I've just spotted a familiar face. I think you missed a bit. Oh no, we're just taking the top lines out. What are you doing, Em? Taking the top lines out. What does that mean to the uninitiated? Can't tell now because I've lost it. Oh, okay. All the heels collect except for this. Okay, cool. We use like spray to like glow it up, and if we leave it in, the heel will fall out. So we have to wash it all out before they can go home. So she's been through the ring, this one? Yes. And who, who are you showing these with, Em? Um, Tegan Hall. Tegan Hall. These are her girls. It's just a hobby out, and uh, well, can I ask one more question? Yes. Why don't you dress this smart for work? Because I'm going to be so beautiful. <laughs> Farm Vet Films Ultras will recognize Emily as one of the techs I was helping on a big disbudding session last spring. She's showing these Holsteins for a friend and it's not long before I bump into another familiar face. This time Bruce Ede, a farming client who I've seen on Twitter already, was down here yesterday getting his cattle bedded in. Bruce doesn't run what I would consider a traditional Kiwi system but I'll let him tell you a bit more about that. Just know that he's a real GC. For the non-Kiwis that stands for good chap. So yeah we've got Bruce. Bruce, you're at uh, Fairley, yep. which is up just north of Tappanoo, so it's Kelso. Kelso, Kelso yeah. Isn't it? yeah. Yep. And so what have you been up to today? Uh, we've been here with a team of cows at the Gore Show. Did you get on okay? We're down alright, we won the all, uh, the Ayrshire Senior Champion Cow. Yes. Uh, reserve Ayrshire Cow. Very nice. And all breeds six and over cow, so yeah, we won a few ribbons. It's competitive and you come here to do a job, to have a few beers and catch up with people that you haven't seen since the last time, you know, and it's, so it's quite an enjoyable social thing as well. Like the cows they've seen while I've been out here have mostly not been this type cow, no, so what, what, how do your cows differ to, uh, to the Kiwi, yeah, Kiwi Kiwi Cross? Cross? Yeah, well we have purebred Ayrshire Holstein and we've got a handful of jerseys as well, so. Yeah. Born and bred through the pedigree stuff I've grown up with and that's all we sort of, that's the blinkers I've got on, but um, you know, the crossbred cow. Doesn't, They're not your cup of tea. Doesn't spin my wheels. Doesn't light your fire. No, I think the thing for us is the breeding side of it. Like yeah. I get excited for, for mating time, for calving time, seeing a cow develop from a calf to whatever, you know, whereas she's not just a number in the herd. No, no, no. Uh, you could, I could tell you every cow that of ours in the team there, I could tell your mother, father, and so on and so forth. As a vet, like, it's just nice to go and see different systems and different yeah. cows, you know, so it's, you know, like, there is the Kiwi system if you like, but Absolutely. we'll get up with yours at some point, I'm sure, oh, and we'll yeah. see how, you know, it's a bit different, like your cows are mostly in wintered up, like yeah. wintered in sheds. And yeah, I know what you're saying, we're probably a Euro type of system with yeah. split calving, winter milking, you know, cows in, in free stall barns, you know, we even winter our yearling heifers, they're yeah. on uh, straw beds, so. Um, when we're certainly, we're the, we're the different ones down here. I was filming yesterday, and it's, they'll probably go out after this, but with um, Clark Scott. Oh, yes. With the Limmy, so yeah. people are just going to think I've come over to New Zealand to find it, like Holstein yeah, yeah, cows yes. and limos and bulls. And funnily enough, we buy our limo bulls <laughs> yeah. from Clark. I remember so you there said. you go. I'm sure Bruce has got plenty to get on yeah. with. Uh, I'm just going to milk this girl out. I yeah. imagine they still have to be milked, of course, yeah. uh, to, uh, to keep, them, keep them comfortable. Yeah, she's probably got about. 15 hours milk on her. Where does the milk go? Does this get? Uh, just a wee tank out the back, and then it goes to some love, some lucky pigs get to get to live on it. Oh, for the I you never think about. Anyway, yeah. thanks, Bruce. Yeah, That's no awesome. Problem. We'll Good leave you to you, it. The further I get around the show, the more it strikes me. I could very easily be in rural Britain. You would find pretty much everything I've seen at the UK equivalent: the tractors, the ponies, the livestock classes, the trade stands, the trays and trays of cakes, biscuits, fruit, veg, even down to the dahlias. And that makes me laugh because it seems I've moved to the other side of the world just to come home. Now, I'm certainly not the only one of my peers from school, or from uni, to be working or studying abroad. But normally for a 20-something, the destination would be somewhere like New York, Berlin, Madrid, Sydney, Hong Kong, 
or Shanghai. Definitely not the country music loving, cheese roll eating, fanatically fly fishing gore with its roads apparently built wide enough for tractors. I set out at the start of the day to get a handle on Kiwi farm shows. It turns out they're basically the same as what you'd find in the British countryside and that raises a different question for me. In the UK it was unusual enough for me to go from London to the rural north of England. Most people would make the opposite journey in their 20s. So how did I end up doing the same thing in the southern hemisphere? Am I just a moth to this proverbial flame? The obvious answer is that I'm a farm vet. I go where there are lots of livestock, especially cattle, and both Northumberland and Southland have lots of these. Even so, there are less remote options. So why? And I think it comes down to this. I'm just willing to give it a punt. In fact, I've made a living out of it, a living out of moving to untrendy, non-destinations, although admittedly, that might now be changing for Northumberland. And guess what? They've all been outstanding places to live and work, and you wouldn't meet characters like Mark Tiller or Bruce Seed anywhere else. In fact, for the right person, I can't recommend it enough. You might not end up in Gore itself, but it may well be somewhere as gorgeous. Never mind. Saying all of that, I did today bump into another familiar farming couple who I didn't manage to catch on camera, but who have been in a recent video. One of them said that the best thing about New Zealand and Southland in particular was that no one comes here because no one knows how good it is and that I shouldn't tell anyone. So if he asks, I told you it was So it's about one o'clock now, roasting hot, especially with my little schoolboy backpack on. Yeah, I think I said at the start, I was gonna go around there and try and show you how a New Zealand sort of ag show, ag fair was different to a UK one. And basically the differences I can spot are none, apart from people's accents uh, and the fact that it's a, a lot hotter, at least compared to Northumberland. So I don't know, it's really interesting that was the first one. You saw me chatting to Bruce there from Fairley. He was saying that's the first one they've had cat lap for, um, I think he said three, maybe four years. Most recently because of COVID, because so they had no show. But also before that, New Zealand was dealing with an outbreak of something called uh, Mycoplasma bovis or M. bovis. And so that stopped those movements of cattle. So yeah, three or four years since anyone's had any cattle. And I think everyone was rearing to get back. And so it shows you in these sort of smaller, more agricultural communities, just how important these things are to them. Um, it's really, really easy for me, for vets, you know, in our sort of technical capacity to say, oh, well, livestock shouldn't go to fairs because, you know, the show ring encourages people to select livestock for the wrong traits and the show judges, you know, spread a disease and all that. And I'm not saying there's no merit to that, but the longer I sort of move in these communities and see what's important to them and see the benefits of these sorts of things, the more balanced, I guess, my view gets and say, right, okay, in a perfect world, from a disease point of view, through that tiny narrow lens, we wouldn't have shows and things, but there's big upsides to them out with. So how can we continue to reap the benefits of that while perhaps mitigating some of the potential downsides? So yeah, I'll leave you on that slightly philosophical note. Have a good week and I'll see you for the next one.